Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be talking about data visualization, um, specifically a interface I've been experimenting with uh, to use dialog with some charting software called Vega. But you know, first, uh, I'd like to give a very brief introduction to this idea called the grammar of graphics. So it's laid out in this book by Leyland Wilkinson, where uh, he remarks how, you know, sort of due to necessity and and over over time, many graphics libraries that you might see um, tend to provide some collection of functions that are kind of specific for producing specific chart types. And you know, perhaps the implementers have managed to develop it in a way where they share methods for you know, adjusting the properties of graphics across different chart types. Um, but he noticed how there's not really so much of a formal foundation for doing data visualization and producing graphics. So he sort of explores what that looks like. So the grammar of graphics in broad strokes, there are two kind of parts, a mathematical step and then a kind of aesthetic step for putting the pretty pictures up. Um, so the mathematical step here, we have, um, I'll do it this way. You know, for any function f that maps a set A onto a set B, there's a tuple A and the f of A where A is a member of the set A and that tuple is a subset of the Cartesian product of the two sets A and B. And if that sounds quite abstract, uh, it's because it is. Um, but basically, for, for our purposes, what it means is you want to take your data values and map them onto some scale, you know, of a different range of numbers that could be continuous or discrete scale. Um, and then you're going to use the values from those scales with aesthetic functions to control the visual properties of the marks the blobs you put up on the page, like it could be the length of a line or the thickness of it or the color or those sorts of things. That's the basic idea of then getting some building blocks that you can compose together to create a wide range of charts. So Vega is one of a number of software packages that implement some kind of visualization grammar based on this idea. So you specify your data as a table, a table like the tables you'll be familiar with. You have these scale functions that do this mapping. Um, you can set properties of things like the axes to visualize the scales, you set the properties of the marks. Um, Vega also has some stuff to do with interactivity that uh, I'm not really gonna go into. But the specifications in Vega are expressed in JSON. So, you know, we all know JSON, and um, luckily what you do is you go on the Vega site, you read all the documentation, you sort of put the specification together, and then you call quad JSON. So, uh, that's, that's the interface. <laughs> um, no, obviously, obviously not quite, that would be uh, really tedious. And not only that, but I haven't quite given the whole story, right? Um, the interface I've actually, been, I've actually been exploring is to something called Vega Lite, which is a like higher level specification language or grammar. So you get some shorter JSON specs and then those compile into the long Vega thing. And then that's rendered using a JavaScript library called D3 to produce uh, SVGs or you can even get raster graphics with an HTML5 canvas. Um, but very much the same idea, just at a higher level, you specify you know, what type of mark do you want and some properties thereof. You specify these encoding channels. You say, I want this column of data to be my you know, position on the x-axis. I want this column of data to control the color, etc. cetera. Um, the grammar of graphics and their implementations also talk about data transformation. So um, for example, if you want to create a histogram, you might aggregate on some column with the function count, and in the spec, you have to write the word count. Um, but I think, and you can do this in the interface that I'm sort of presenting here, but uh, I figured as APL, as you probably do most of the data transformation in APL. Um, and there's also functions for composing charts and having multiple displays 
on a screen or taking the same specification and applying it to different subsets of your data so that you can um, present multiple dimensions of your data set. Um, but I won't, again, be actually showing that stuff today. But here's a Vega Lite specification. You can see it's sort of much shorter. One thing to note is like the data is embedded. So here we've got a JSON list of objects, so name value pairs. Um, it's not the most efficient representation of tables, but I'll get back to that. Then you just specify the mark type. Here's bar chart or bars. Um, and then you use these encoding fields to map the columns or the fields onto the different um, axes in this case, X and Y. So we've got these nominal categories and they get distributed evenly along the X axis and our numeric quantitative values just dictate the length of the bars. So what's the dialogue interface to this look like? It's obviously not just uh, write some JSON. First of all, we clearly want to be able to provide data from APL. So we do that as tables. I'll be more specific in a moment. Um, it's also nice because of quad JSON that when you have the specification in the namespace, you can just use variable assignment to change some of the parameters. Um, but we also didn't want to say, oh, go read the Vega Lite documentation, create a namespace and convert the JSON into some variable assignments because that would be tedious. So we have a couple of functions that sort of help with setting parameters in, in common ways that you would want to. Um, and then something else, maybe a bit ironically, given what I said at the beginning about the grammar of graphics, is to have some chart functions that for, are for specific chart types where you just provide the data in a specific way and we provide a bunch of sensible defaults that you could also tweak. And being a JavaScript library, uh, obviously we use the HTML renderer to run that. You can pop up a window to preview a graph or, or render the images and save those. So as I said, uh, data you provide as tables, mostly nested matrices, I guess, in the most intuitive sense. You've got uh, a header and some columns. And a quick note on the data types. Um, we decided to um, try and infer data for these like simple chart functions, right? So we detect if you've got numeric or character data, because that's what we've got in APL. And if it's numeric, we're going to assume the quantitative data type in the spec. Uh, if it's character data, then it will be nominal categorical data. Um, maybe there's some scope to try and infer time, st um, yeah, time stamps and other things, but haven't really looked at that yet. Um, but that's just what some part of the interface does to assume your data types uh, when you input the data. But yeah, the other thing about tables well, the nice thing really in Vega Lite is I showed you the um, list of objects. That's obviously quite inefficient, but you can also just provide uh, a string that's just CSV text. So we can use CS, uh, quad CSV to convert our data tables into CSV text and just put that into the spec, which is nice and much more efficient. And you also get the added bonus that uh, inverted tables just work the same. So if you want to use those. Right, so as I said, I'm kind of going to frame this in terms of the specific chart functions just to concretize um, and put up some charts for you to see. Uh, I'm only going to do these sort of simple ones, but hopefully it will con convey the idea well enough. So first example is bar chart, but um, I'll just briefly mention about the default encoding. So as I said, you have to specify these encodings, but for our like quick chart functions in this interface, what you do is you provide the table and we're just going to assume that the first column is going to be your x values, the second column is going to be your y values, and if you provide a third column, then that's going to control the color. So in a very trivial example here, a simple table, you call the bar function. It takes the data as input. It actually returns the namespace, which is that vega like specification, uh, and then you use the view function to pop that up, and you just get bar chart. So no, it's good. Um, and yeah, here seeing uh, if you provide the third column, then that controls the colors. And this is what the, the bar chart function looks like 
right, inside. Well, I mean, not all the way down, but um, at one level, these are these functions to help define the specification. And you can see it's like kind of clean. I hope you think so. Uh, I think so. Basically, you have this chart function that takes the data and then just does the quad CSV, injects it into the spec, and returns the namespace with nothing else really in it. The mark function just literally sets like chart.mark gets bar, um, which is kind of trivial, and you could do that yourself. But also, this, this left argument here could be uh, JSON 5 text, or it could be a namespace that adds additional parameters to the mark type um, that you want. And then here you can see us calling the monadic encode function, which the name uh, maybe needs a rethink. But um, in the monadic case, it does that uh, default encoding that I talked about a second ago. Or if you provide a namespace or JSON5 left argument, you can modify that. So next example, here's a line chart. Uh, we're doing the sign of a thousand numbers between 0 and 2 pi. Um, looks like that. You just call the, the line function, uh, and you get a line. And what does the line function? Oh, wait, not quite what does the line function look like. Right, a point about if you want to have multiple series. So what you might often do is um, produce multiple series of data like I'm doing here, so the sine and the cosine. And you end up with this, uh, what's called wide form data where you know, the fact that one column is sine and cosine is, is sort of encoded in the, in the headers themselves. Um, but Vega Lite, I mean, you can do it with this in Vega Lite. It's a little bit more involved. But Vega Lite sort of generally prefers long form data. And as I said, with the default encoding, you want the first one to be the x, the second to be the y, and the third to control the color. So we need the third one to sort of be keys into these two um, functions. So we have this sort of wrapper function, but I think you can probably imagine what it does. It's not that uh, much transformation, but it basically just re um, reshapes the x values all the way down, concatenates the y values, and then turns those headings into uh, keys in the third column. So then after we've done that, now we can just call the line function, and we get multiple series. And this is what the line function looks uh, like underneath. It's uh, shockingly similar to the bar function. You literally just change the mark type um, from a bar to a line, and all the other stuff is working the same way. And I won't really belabor the point with scatter. It's the same thing with points. So hopefully you can see how this sort of idea of um, composing the basic pieces to make different chart types is starting to work. Um, but pi is a little bit different. You do just change the mark type to arc, but then in the encoding, we detect that because setting x and y values for a pi chart doesn't, I mean, you can do it and you get an output, um, but it's not what you want. Um, instead, we set the first column to be the angle of the slices and the second column to be the colors of a pie chart. So. Um, here's a little example that's uh, the yield of some barley from different farms um, that was studied in the 1990s by uh, Richard Becker and others. And in particular, it's used as a data visualization example um, to show how you know the visualization clearly shows a mistake in the data. So I don't know. See if you can spot the mistake in the data. You can't, you can't yet. Um, Firstly, I'm going to aggregate the data. As I said, in, in APL, um, we're just summing across all the years and all the varieties. Uh, what's the total yield per farm? OK, and that's what we want to plot on a pie chart. So we've got now our long form data, and we just call the pie function, and we get this pie chart. But that's not quite, <laughs> that doesn't seem that useful. Um, as you can see, since the farms are in the first column, the categorical data, it's that affects the angle. So that gets evenly distributed. We get e equal slices. And then the numerical data for the yield is turned into the colors. Um, it's not quite what you want. But if you just uh, reverse the columns, then uh, that's probably more, more what you were expecting. 
Um, I sort of put this example in to show the, the data manipulation to chart correspondence, but um, obviously it kind of looks like the default should probably be the other way around, and maybe we'll maybe we will do that. So yeah, that's the kind of uh, high-level wrapper functions that then produce this this Vega spec that you can use to to put charts up. Um, but you'll obviously be okay with the defaults for just quickly exploring data and um, seeing visualizations. But what if you want to modify the graphs to, to show different things? So I'll quickly show uh, how that kind of looks. So this time we're aggregating that same data, but uh, it's each farm for each year. So we've got two years, 1931 and 1932 and we want to plot the yields for each farm across both years. So, I mean, let's just try putting that table in and see what happens. It's not, it kind of gives you uh, all three dimensions there, or sort of three <laughs> aspects laid out. You get this stacked bar chart. By default, the colors get stacked in the bars, and I mean, maybe if you stare carefully, you can see what the mistake is, or maybe you know the example. Um, but maybe it's not that obvious yet. The other thing that's obviously annoying here, like I said, we infer the data type as numeric um, if it looks like numbers. And so you end up with this continuous scale in the year 1931.8. Uh, doesn't quite make sense. Um, but because it's discrete data in the, in the bars themselves, it, it doesn't look too bad, um, but it's clearly not right. So this would be clearer if we could put the uh, two series as bars next to each other uh, and compare the two years that way rather than on, on top and below each other. Um, and we can do that by setting something that X offset according to the year. Um, and we'll change the type explicitly from numeric to nominal or quantitative to nominal because we, we know we want to have these uh, distinct discrete years. Um, and we're also going to change the color, which has already been encoded in the, in the default encoding to the um, year in the third column. But we need to change the type of that to nominal as well. It's a little bit fiddly, and maybe there's something we can do to uh, make you know, uh, channels that, according to the same field, maybe they can automatically get the same type if you change it. Or there's, um, It's an experiment. There's room for, for it to develop. Uh, you can also set uh, top level specification, or in fact, you could take an entire Vega light -like specification without the data and provide it to the left argument of the chart spec function, um, and then just and then just produce the chart that way. So here we're giving this these left arguments, right? So the the chart dot bar thing does the default encoding, um, but then our top level arguments on the left change the title. Uh, and then we modify the encoding using, using the same encode function and passing in our, our options that are there in, in JSON 5. Uh, but that could have been a namespace as well. So from there, that's where we get um, you know, this visualization. Now, the actual example for this so-called Morris mistake uh, is a trellis plot of, of some like scatter charts, but you see the sort of colors switched around. Also, I've given, given the game away there. Um, the mistake is that barley yields across all farms decreased in 1932 compared to 1931, except for at Morris Farm. And why is that? Is that because they have the magic uh, barley growing touch? No, it's because the data was wrong and the data for those two years was literally uh, flipped the wrong, wrong way around. Um, but yeah, that's, that's that example. Uh, and how you sort of can modify your charts to to look different ways. Um, that's all I, I sort of wanted to present in terms of the uh, interface today. Um, it's still fairly experimental, um, and there's a lot of design space that we need to explore for it. Um, Josh David has the GitHub repository because he started the project, and I just sort of um, stole it off of him. Um, no, I'm still committing to the same thing. But as of speaking right now, the stuff that I've shown isn't on the main 
a branch of, of Josh's repository, but you know, shortly after this we'll uh, clean some stuff up and, and look at pushing that. Um, but I also want to mention, uh, I think Paul's name's been mentioned already this week, um, the Carlisle Group, Paul Mansour has been exploring a kind of similar space of having um, these high level chart functions where you don't really have to do much specification at all um, in a project called Playfair. So he's doing a sort of similar idea, we've been talking with, um, with Josh and Paul uh, of just providing the data a specific way and we're gonna make some assumptions, but he's doing it with a sharp plot as the underlying chart technology rather than, rather than Vega. Um, he's got an interesting post on his Tool of Thought blog sort of comparing uh, briefly some different charting libraries. So as I said, we want to experiment and refine that API a bit. Um, uh, underneath the pretty exterior I showed, it's a little bit uh, ugly in places, uh, especially the way we have to like manipulate the JSON as this um, namespace object. I want to look at doing that a bit more elegantly. Um, then we'll just make some more of these top level chart functions for the obvious things you want. Um, figure out how to do view co compositions. You saw in Josh's talk yesterday, he had that scatter plot matrix thing, and, and that works, but it's not in the, the kind of encode mark chart scheme. Um, we also want to look at interactivity. Um, Vega Lite has really good support for like interactive plots on a web page. Um, the main sort of issues are you have to do more of the specification in Vega Lite. Uh, in that JSON document. And for certain interactivity, what you actually need to do is provide all of the data and then do the, all, use the transformation functions in Vega Lite to, do, um, to declare that you want to do these aggregations when you click on a button or when you drag and select some subset of the data, for example. Um, so that's a bit of a limitation just in principle of how we can do this, um, which sort of brought a question to my mind of, you know, this concept's kind of cool and uh, could be interesting, especially if there was like an APL implementation of some visualization grammar where you specify all your parameters as APL arrays or APL namespace. It would be even cleaner. You know, you saw me using JSON5 as the left arguments, but I said you could provide namespaces. And if we had the array notation, then you could write those namespaces literally, which would be quite nice for the sort of name value pairs object model. And the other thing is these data transformations, APLers probably want to express them in APL. So it would be nice if that framework allowed you to express your, your data transformations in APL and get the interactivity that comes with it. Um, but that's something we can't do when interfacing with this JavaScript library. Well, maybe we could do calling back to APL and taking a subset of the data and then pushing it back up. But it sounds like a fair rigmarole for, for the benefit. Um, and that's not a very concludy tone of voice, but that is all that I uh, wanted to present. So uh, thanks very much for uh, listening um, and watching, and happy to talk about this for the next five minutes. <laughs>